How's it going? How's it going? It is I, TJ, Tarai Jack, and welcome again to another Impact Successful Friends. And today, I've got no any other, someone else that I've been admiring from a distance. I like this guy. And I know you're going to like him too, and his name is Donna Bonsai. Donna Bonsai, how's it going? Welcome aboard. Good new TJ. Thank you for inviting me. As I said earlier, I'm really honored, and I feel humbled that you're yeah. having on. And without a doubt, I like you too. You're a generally a nice guy. I really, really like you. Shall we get a room, Dana? We like each other, is it? Yeah, but I don't like you like that. <laughs> That's awesome stuff. Dana, you are based in Bloemfontein, um, a, quite a fascinating small town, but you've been doing property there um, much longer than I've been doing it. And I really like the strategies that you've been doing. And uh, we're going to kind of like dive deep into it. But you didn't start off as, as a property person, right? When you left school and things like that. Um, who, who is Dana? How do you get to stumble into property? Uh, to right. Yeah, you know, I grew up in Bethlehem, yeah. in the rural town here in the Free State. Yeah. And as a youngster, I decided I'd like to become a physiotherapist. Right. And I was very lucky I got selected and by the University of the Free State here in Bloemfontein. And I studied physiotherapy and I qualified in 2004. I did my comm serve in 2005. By chance, reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad or Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah. I didn't take too much notice. The next year, I started working for private practice here in Bloemfontein. Right. And I realized that, yo, you work hard. You might have a fairly decent bank balance, but you've got no time to enjoy the fruits of your labor. And then I remembered Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I went back and I read it and I made an effort to do property investing like he says we should. When, when, when what year was that? That's 2006 that I started, that I read it. And yeah. although I didn't necessarily buy my first property in 2006, I had to get a few things in place, which took me about two years before I could buy my first one because... Richard Poor Dad is more about the mindset and changing the way you think about property and money. And I realized that the way I was thinking and the way I had been brought up was totally wrong. And I had two years of work working on myself rather than on the property portfolio to get those changes in place. Yeah. And, and if I look back at 2006, I think around about 2006, I was just kind of like starting off to be employed at a particular time. And it wasn't a wonderful job. Um, and there you are, you're starting off. And how did you stumble on the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? In my comp year, I was towards the end of that year. I was staying with friends of mine. Yeah. And yeah. the one friend had the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, next to his bed. Right. I love reading. I always have. Yeah. And I asked him, would he mind if I read the book? And that's how I got it got exposed to it okay but in the book rich dead rich dead poor dead um it, it it speaks about many many ways in which you know one could gain financial freedom um and obviously me and you that that's why we like each other we we are big fans of robert kiyosaki in terms of his thinking some of his books over the years that we've known each other we've been sharing books um and lessons mm -hmm. that we've been learning from what he's doing uh, in what he says in his books. And there's many uh, windows or doors to financial freedoms other than property. Mm. And you decided to go into property. And I'm just trying to think, or should I say, maybe the, ask, the question I should ask you is, why did you choose property over any, anything else? Um, as I said, with property... It's not, I wouldn't say it's a fully passive income. Yeah. There's a, a certain amount of involvement that you have to have. Yeah. But I like the fact that you don't have to work 24 hours a day. You actually do have time to enjoy the fruits of your labor. The other thing that stood out for me is that I could use OPM and acquire assets for myself. Um, 
at that stage, I was definitely not in position to buy or acquire any assets with my own money. I had to learn how to use OPM to do it. And that's what do you, definitely. What do you mean, Dana, by OPM? OPM is an abbreviation for other people's money. Okay. Hmm. Uh, I, I think. I think we need to dive in a little bit there in terms of OPM, other people's money. Um, I think that that acronym and that uh, phrase have been loosely used that a lot of us, you know, for instance, when I started off and they were talking about OPM, I was like, okay, so where do I find these people from? Um, in your case, in your journey, what are some of the types of OPMs that you have utilized? I think starting off, it was definitely the bank. Yeah. But the bank in many forms, you don't, yes, you get bonds for your property, yeah. but there are also other forms of OPM there, short-term loans, credit cards, or actually the other name I have for credit cards is investment cards. Yeah. Um, then you have private money. Yeah. You have portfolio lenders. You have hard money lenders. You've just got to use your mind to or be creative to try and acquire other people's money. Money which you can use and make it work harder than what those individuals are able to do. Right, right. So you, you, you based in Bloom, uh, mm -hmm. so you left Free State, so your parents, uh, your folks are still in Free State, um, and now you're in Bloom. Um, and being in Bloom, are you doing properties in Bloom, or where, where do you do your properties? Yes, most of my property investment is here in Bloemfontein. I do have one or two properties in Cape Town. However, Bloemfontein is my main focus. It's interesting that we talk about this in the week. I attended the Rueda Real Estate Investor Mag um, Investor Conference where they spoke about residential property and they put out a graph where they compared all the metros to each other. Believe it or not, Bloemfontein is considered a metro in South Africa. Anyway, and... <laughs> And of all the metros, Bloemfontein, with regards to price values and the amount of property sold, is lagging. So, in my opinion, I'm perfectly based. There isn't much competition around, in my opinion. Yeah, but I, I mean, I've told you that over the years, right? That um, uh, you, you are in, in what I would call the investor's heaven. Um, and over and above that, you still have... Um, uh, any other metro issues, which is accommodation for the normal people. And also, you still have another problem, which is student, uh, student accommodation. Um, mm. So those are the, it's, it's typical problems for any other metro, right? Yes. Uh, and you're in there, you have no competition. And, and I think that's why you've been slaying it of late, because, I, but we can't say of late, your journey been, you've been at it steady, growing nicely around it. What do you focus on uh, in property? There's, there's quite a lot of things that happens in, in property. Cash flow. Cash flow is king. Beyond any doubt, the gap. Yes, you can't guarantee capital growth in any way. Okay. However, if you have cash flow going well from day one, that's what you have. And through student accommodation, I try and get cash flow going as best as I possibly can. Okay, so your, your property investments, is, is it heavy on the student accommodation or because you you're, you're both in Bloom and Cape Town, right? So yes. um, are, are they in both towns, are they both student accommodation? No, in Cape Town, I've got Airbnbs, short-term letting. Right. Uh, but in Bloomington, it's big time student accommodation. Okay. And how many mm. students now, how many students do you house now? Currently, I house around 250 beds. I yeah. am, however, waiting for zonings and building plans to go through the municipality. And once those are through and they're approved as they've been set forth, my yeah. bed count will double to around 500. Wow. Yeah. On the same properties or acquiring new properties? On the same properties just further developing the properties or consolidating the earths which are next to each other and stuff like that. Wow, that, that's a big number, Dana. And um, are, are you then equipped for that growth? Because that's a 100% growth. I'm trying to. Um, I just recently started um, with a business coach through Action Coach, yeah. um, wanting to build 
my portfolio, build the brand. And um, so definitely my view of the business and the portfolio, I wouldn't say has changed, but through this coach, I'm getting more things, the admin, everything behind in the right way that it should. I'm starting to work more on my business than while I'm working in my business. What do you mean by that? The, in the end, I don't necessarily want to sell my business, but I want to have a saleable business, a business which can run independent of me. Okay. For me to do that, I need to have structures and procedures in place right. to make sure that the people know what to do, irrespective of whether I'm there or not. Yeah, yeah. I, li I like that concept, Tudana. Um, and, and I like the fact that, you know, when I look at you on your journey, you started off in 2006 and eventually 2008, eight nine, you bought your first property mm -hmm. and now you're housing um, just below mm -hmm. 250 students and you can literally double that up by zoning correctly, mm -hmm. which then also gives me the thinking that you've been buying steadily. You understand your neighborhood very, very well. There are not so many ins institutions in bloom. Um, how many institutions are there anyway? There are the two big institutions, which is C the Central University of Technology and the yeah. University of the Free State. There are, however, other private colleges as well, but the two big ones of the two that I've mentioned. Okay. And you mm -hmm. cater for, for both of those universities? Yes. My plan, I definitely shop around both. And yeah. I try and shop within a radius of about a kilometer of both. I like it when you say you shop. It's like you're going to buy something, you know. But, you but are, that's what it's know? about. <laughs> it's having fun. It's, uh, for example, my wife, who I love dearly, yeah. loves shopping. Right, right. Going to the mall, I don't necessarily enjoy that as much. But shopping for property gives me another kick, another... That's really my passion. I enjoy it. Awesome stuff. Are you mm. in the business with your wife uh, now that you've mentioned your wife? Ironically... When I started off with property, we were dating about a year, year and a half. And okay. I said, that's what I'm doing. And she said, no, she doesn't think that's for her. It's going to take too long. It's not going to make any money. Yeah. And I said, it's fine. Uh, please leave me to it. Let me do what I want to do. Right. And in, in 2017, when I was able to sell off my part in the practice, which I had built and managed for 11 years, which carried my name and my practice number, and I could actually climb out full time, I think her eyes opened. And since she's bought three properties herself. And her on, so, and, and then, so let's go back. Because I was going to yes. come back to the conversation of your practice. Mm. Right? Um, and, so let's rewind? Yeah, let's rewind. Because there you are, you, you started working now and you start buying properties and you actually now open up your own practice. So you've got your own business now. Yes. Right? And you grow that business to, to what level? I don't want to brag about it. Yeah. But I had the biggest practice in Bloemfontein. My man. We, we were six permanent physiotherapists. Yeah. And we had three locums who worked part-time. And we had three physical rooms throughout the city. So for some of you who are listening in and you have never met Dana, I've met Dana. And I, I'm always kind of like being kicked in the bum. Each time it's like, you know, this is what I was doing, but I don't want to brag. And you're always downplaying yourself. And yet, Dana, you know, if we look at it from what is happening out there, it's amazing things that you have achieved that you are achieving. I get that, but it's not me. It's my team. It's the people I work with. I just give guidance and show, let's think of this and go that way. I can't take the accolades. It's not myself. Awesome stuff. I like that. Um, that that's a characteristics that I have stolen from, 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 your, from your book of doing things. Um, and and, and I, I really enjoyed it doing exactly what you're doing there. So, so well done to you. So you sell off your practice, something else that you've been doing and being a, a physio, you're helping people, like literally helping people. Mm -hmm. So your, your gratification is, I mean, I, I've, I've never been in the medical 
uh, field before. But for me, when I was in the banking system and I would see I'm able to help someone, they're getting fund for this and I'm able, able to help them with that solution, with that system from a banking perspective. My gratitude was like, wow. But from your perspective, you are giving life back to someone who possibly was now, I mean, accidents or whatever that you, uh, you, you used to deal in. And you leave all of that for, for property. The irony is that I'm helping people in property too. Yeah. Please realize that I do believe that we aren't here for ourselves. We are here to contribute. We are here to add value. And yeah. yes, as a physiotherapist, and I still work part-time as a physio, I do help people. I do make a difference. Yeah. But I'm only able to help one at a time. If I have a really busy full day, I may be able to help 15 people. However, through my current property portfolio, I provide housing to 250 people. I've been able to employ five previously unemployed people full time. I'm able to have contractors work on a daily basis and they are able to employ people. Yeah. That, and that the more important excited, thing, Donna. exactly. And to come back, those people, those 250 I'm housing are the future of our country. My man. They are the guys, the future leaders. Yeah. So I really feel I, I am forced. I'm, I'm compelled to make South Africa better. And this is the way I'm trying to do it. I think, Dana, it's, it's, it's almost having a very different thinking of what you are doing now, what is the impact thereof? Because I don't think that it many a times as entrepreneurs and as business people, we actually kind of like stop sometimes and then we think about it because if you are looking at the five people that you are saying that uh, you have now employed and they are full time, and you still have main, a maintenance team of uh, another people that other people that you bring in as contractors in, from time to time, um, if we were to put all those men hours there and the people that you pay, I read an article at a, at a point and they were saying that from an African context, you know, um, for every one person that is employed, you get to hit there's an impact of 10 people. Correct. Right. That and, humbles and, me. I didn't realize it. Yeah. That's great. And, and, and from that perspective, you are in control of that. And you are the choir conductor in making sure that it is happening. There you go to business on one end. It's giving you what you're looking for. And there you're also providing food for other people. And collectively, all of us, we're doing something greater than than any of us could think about. I don't think that it many a times we actually think of, of the impact that we do. Exactly. You've got a family, um, you're married, um, and how do you balance the business and, and, um, and your family time? Thank goodness to property. As I yeah. said, I resigned in 2018. Yeah. out of my own practice, climbed out of there. Yeah. And now I help my wife with overflow of her practice. In other words, I make her hours less and which makes us more available to be there for the kids and frees up our time big time. Wow, I like that. Someone asked me the other day, um, Dana, uh, TJ, is, re is property really, you, you, you seem like you, you, you've got success, but are you really successful? And I did, my response to them was, I think I am successful, but how do you measure success? And it was blank on the other side. And I went, are you still there? And they said, yeah. And I said, what is success for you? And he says, I haven't really thought about it. I, I've always thought of it as money. And I said, mm -hmm. for me, it's not. It's bigger than that. Because if you look at the word success, in the dictionary, it says doing what makes you happy, right? Simple. That's, that's what it is. Exactly. And, and with that, for me, having that time that you've just spoken about with the kids, with my missus, and maybe sometimes not even doing wow things, but just chilling. 
Exactly. I, I think when I was employed, I didn't have a lot of that because I, I, I would work in blocks. And for me, I used to work out of Africa. So I used to, I used to travel a lot. So for me, this has been an enormous success on my side mm. to win the time that I'm in my house next to my beautiful wife every night. That's to me is success. I, I can't even put money on it. And, and you, you kind of like saying almost the same thing here. But Dana, all of this now that you're doing, 250 students, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. When you started off in student accommodation, now you don't, you don't do anything else other than student accommodation besides uh, the Cape Town stuff that you do with Airbnb. Um, I'm sure you had some stumbling blocks along the way. You mentioned the fact that, you know, at some point you needed to sort out your head and you, you literally spent two years around that. Um, what, what, what was your stumbling block in those two years? That's the first question. And then the second question is, as you have journeyed on now, what, what are some of the other challenges that you've faced now? Yeah, okay. Starting off, there were many challenges, as I said. Yes, my mindset, I didn't have the education I needed. I didn't have the upbringing, the way I was taught. Yeah. As I said, I had to work more on myself than what I did necessarily on the property portfolio to get that going. But was, what really was a big issue was credit and the way I thought about credit and my right. credit record. A person, if we were only taught at school that how important that is. So I had to clean that up firstly yeah. and make sure that my credit was in a good position. Yeah. So that was, those are the things, the big things there in the beginning. As of now, the big stumbling block, the very, very big stumbling block is Mangaung Metro Municipality. Right. Um, I don't want to complain, yeah. but the reality is that I'm in month 34 of my zonings. Wow. And as you just said, I can literally double my bed count. Yeah. In the week I had a talk, we, were, we had to submit our applications for accreditation for the university to house NSY students the weekend they passed. Yeah. And um, the town and city planner I use asked me if I wouldn't consider putting in my other applications. Currently, I have 10 applications in. Yeah. I still have about another 10, which I could submit to Mangung Metro Municipality. And I asked him, how much money does he think I've paid already for my zonings? And he took a guess. In the region of half a mole to three quarters of a mole. I said, great. That's relatively perfect. And I asked him the question, what if you had to take that amount of cash? Cash, not credit. And you walked into a Toyota, for example, and you bought a vehicle cash. Yeah. And Toyota said, congratulations, Mr. Jack, for example. Yeah. Here's your new vehicle. You can expect to get your new vehicle, which you've paid for cash today, in roughly 36 months. Would you be happy with that? And he said, no. And I said, but that's exactly what I've got. I've had to fork out a load of money and my zonings are not coming through. Yeah. So without a doubt, those are the biggest issues. It's a big pain, that one there. Um, And I know from council to council, from different municipalities, there's different timelines. Yours here is is at a different level. I haven't had 36 months before. This is my first one. Yeah, the the reality is that I think the free state and Bloemfontein especially yeah. is in big trouble. I mean, a big part of the state capture was here. I mean, we just had up the um, what do you call it, the municipal manager. She was arrested a few weeks ago, part of the state capture trial. So I'm just. We big issues are emblem. That's without a doubt. And and yet in the same breath, um, those the opportunities, or should I say, the challenges that we are faced with right now, um, if if the administration was strong enough, or should I say, was in place, and all these things were not there, there could be a huge benefit both to the council and to you and to other uh, government uh, facilities, which is in this case here, the, the, 
the universities because now they're not under pressure and um, we could also be solving the biggest problem which is now uh, student housing and all of us we could be making money because you could be affording now to be paying uh, well kind of like higher t uh, rates and taxes now because you're in a different bracket of zoning and the municipality will be able to collect more money and if they collect more money they're making more money and I mean, the ripple effect of how all of this can just work together if we have the right people in place. Yeah, I, I, I hear you there. I hear you. I, I, want uh, to I can't you. help but... Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. I can't help but doubt what are the real... What are the people who are in those places? What is their real motivation? What do they want to gain? Are they there for their own pockets or are they really there to help the community? Yeah. That's just the rhetorical question that I'm asking. I think it's a question that we all ask ourselves sometimes, especially when things are not moving like this. Dana, you mentioned that there are some things that you wish that you could have been taught from growing up. And you touched on, um, for instance, um, around your, the, your, the, your credit, credit in general. Mm. What were some of the negative thoughts that you think that you might have inherited from your childhood and later when you started now reading a little bit more around Robert Kiyosaki and things like that, and having a coach, I mean, you've got a business coach now. What is, what, what shifted? What is the one thing that you can pinpoint on um, other than credit, or even we can dive in into credit a little bit to say, you know, with your upbringing, th this was, it was like that, but obviously now it, it, your, your eyes have opened and when your eyes opened up in that direction, the success now that you have received is X. First with regards to credit, yeah. um, I think everyone goes through it. We always want to buy doodads as Robert Kiyosaki calls them. Everyone wants to buy maybe a new pair of sunglasses, a new t-shirt, maybe a new yeah. car. Yeah. Yeah. But are those real assets? Do they really mean anything for you? Do they really bring anything in? Whereas, and that's what has changed, is that I've learned that that money, which you are you're able to use, use it in a wise manner to bring in real assets, things that put money into your pocket. Right. And the other thing is, I get the funny idea that people always have a bad attitude when they get loan invoices and stuff and money that they have to pay. And that has definitely changed. Initially, when I started, I, I also hated receiving those, having to pay back the money to the bank. Yeah. But now I'm, my attitude has really changed. I consider the bank as my best business partner that I need to treat as well as I possibly can and pay him the money back as soon as I possibly can. Wow. All right. Nice. I like that. Um, Dana, let, let's jump in into your student accommodation. Um, mm. I mean, uh, the one time I visited you, we literally was in one street and you, you, you did this subconsciously, or maybe you did, you, you, you planned it, I don't know, but it gave me like a super amazing kick. Um, we were in one street and it's a cul-de-sac street and you say to me, uh, TJ, that's my house, that one is my house, that's one. But the, the, the plumber or someone like that is coming in with eggs in that house there. And, but we're not going there, we're going here. And I was like, dude, you just have bought the whole street here, right? <laughs> and and, and that, that for me was like, wow. In terms of, number one, you're actually buying off the entire street. You can now improve and dictate what happens in that street. Hmm. And you have control. And with control comes in another aspect where you dictate what happens and the type of a person that now stays in there and your rental and all of those things. And mm. that's something that I appreciate about, about, about your strategy. But I want to ask of you, Dana, what are the maybe top three criteria for you in identifying a student accommodation, whether it's a house, a building, so let's just call it a property. What criteria do you have, if you do have any? I mean, you've been at it for a while now. I'm sure you're now fine-tuning that. Um, 
what's most important is the location. As everyone says, location, location, location. Yeah. I want to buy within walking distance. And I use a kilometer radius as my cutoff. Right. I always want a value add, something extra. For example, I showed you those two properties next to each other, both of them with only single buildings on, but the earths are over 2,000 squares. Right. So there's a huge space to develop extra. 100%. And what I, always, what I always try and do is I want to buy property at around 50 to 75% of market value. I always want to buy, as I say, you make your money when you buy. Right. So in, indirectly what I'm doing is I'm at the start, I'm buying my capital growth. I might be buying about 25% extra immediately and not having to wait for the market to turn and time to go by. So if I have to say those, are, in Bloomfontein. yes, without any doubt, you must just keep on looking. People are very, they don't have patience. They're not willing to go through the numbers. Yeah. In uh, Dolph de Roos, yeah. he speaks of the 11031 rule and Robert Kiyosaki talks the same. We have to look at a hundred properties before you end up buying one. And people didn't believe me when I would say I'd be going through all these numbers and I'd only buy one. Of course, as time goes by and you look at enough numbers, you almost become an expert in your field where you're looking at, where you're focusing. So your numbers start getting less and less and less. Yeah, but in Bloom, and, if you're doing that principle, then you've done numbers for all the properties in Bloom. Bloom is so small. Maybe. But as I say, I'm the only one that's willing to do that. Um, and if I do that, there's no real competition, so I do it. Awesome. You, 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 you speak of um, those, uh, and thanks again for those principles that, that you've just given us. Uh, walking distance is a big winner, right? Yes. Um, but on the other hand, right, in, in Bloom at the moment, um, do you focus on NASFAS students only? How do you manage between the two? Because you get private students, you get NASFAS students, mm. or should I say you get bursary students and you know, NASFAS is kind of like leading here. But there's different bursaries, isn't it? Yes. My goal is to aim for the, the middle to lower income brackets. Okay. Um, they may not be able to for, afford, for example, to live in a campus key or Respublica, for example, where the the rentals are much higher. Yeah. So I, I provide re, uh, accommodation at a cheaper rate, but I do believe that irrespective of what you're paying, you s still deserve the same quality treatment as what you would have got in a Respublica or a campus key. So I try and provide the best possible accommodation you have, clean, all encompassing, safe. Yeah. So yes, my target, is to go mainly for NS5 students. Okay. And thank goodness I did. When most of my colleagues who are also investing in property, they might not have as many beds as I do, but they do invest, yeah. who almost try and aim for the cash students, through lockdown, they were in trouble. Sure. I, however, have between 85 and 90% of my 520 beds are NS5 students. I've been paid right up to this month. In 2019-2020 calendar, uh, what yes. in Bloom, uh, how much is NAS was paying? They paid 32,500 Rand over 10 months. Right, right. Okay. And, and then if we go back to say, um, so now you've got, you, you, you mentioned something that, that kind of like just intrigued something on my mind. You, you bring in students, I, I'd like to say, from a, who are coming from a background of home way that's in a, uh, a lower LSM. And I also, we, during COVID this year, when we was hit with COVID, we realized that our students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds at home, they never left, right? They stayed on. Exactly. Uh, we, we were 100% all the way throughout on, on COVID. So which meant that we, we got paid. But in, in, yours, in your view, uh, why, why did they stay? Let's be realistic, TJ. Yeah. At my houses, 
and I'm guessing the same with yours. They have water. Hot they water. have electricity. Hot water, electricity. Yeah. They have armed response. Yeah. They have Wi-Fi. Yeah. They are within walking distance of the classes if they need to be there and within walking distance of a shop if they need to go to there. Right. But I also think which definitely has a big impact is privacy. They don't have to go to a house where they share a one bedroom place with 12 other people. It really makes studying difficult if you don't have privacy to study. If you even have the Wi-Fi, if you even have the electricity. Exactly. Um, I mean, we, we enrolled one student recently and Reta literally had to show him how, you know, the hot mixer, um, the, the shower mixer. Yes. And so he went in and he was asking there's, there's how does no, this work? The other tape is not there. Yeah. <laughs> and Reta was like, what do you mean? <laughs> um, and and literally, we had to show him that this is how you use a mixer. You know, you turn this way, it's hot, you turn that way. And we actually underestimate where some of these kids are coming from. Exactly. Um, and, and that leads me to a conversation, Dana, in terms of an, from an operation perspective. Anyone who wants to start off student accommodation, because for me, you're, the, you're, you're my guru in terms of student accommodation. Anyone who is wanting to start off student accommodation, from an operational perspective, what are the two tips that you can give them? Because I think buying, for many of people, it's easy. It's an mm. event. You know, it starts and it finishes off, right? Management, it's a process. Mm. And that process can, you, you've been at it for a longer time than us. You have defined it, redefined it. I've gotten stuck at some point. I'm like, I called you and like, Dana, so how do you manage this? And, and, and I think that's the power of being in a network, just having someone mm. else who's doing what you are wanting to do, and they've done it a couple of times. So from an ops perspective, what are some of the operational stuff that you'd say, you know, if you don't have this and this in place, don't bother doing student accommodation because you're going to lose money. Having a good manager. Right. Beyond any doubt, in the 12 years I've been doing this, I've bumped my toe, walked away bleeding with the wrong managers. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then ensuring you have someone that a maintenance team or someone that does inspections and keeps your, make sure your place is looked after. I've had people once again, as a junior, not knowing much where they, they've lit a fire and bride in the lounge. Yeah. And I don't think anyone wants that to happen. <laughs> What floor was this one, Dana? <laughs> Ground floor, thank goodness. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah, but I suppose, you know, if we had to take this from a uh, context of where we are in South Africa, you know, I mean, if you're coming from uh, any of the smaller towns in the rural areas, you light up a fire. There's nothing wrong with lighting up a fire inside the house. Yes, but not on the floor. Do it in the fireplace. <laughs> now, that's what... what Made me angry. I couldn't understand. There is a fireplace. Why do you want to make a fire here on the mat? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, anyway. you know, and that comes through to rules, policies, and procedures. Yes. And now you now need to have all of those things in place. Um, yeah. I think, Dana, the conversation of student accommodation, it is so vast. And there's many fascinating things that we can talk about. But I, I want to change the, the, the topic of the conversation more coming through to, to a deal, right? Um, like, is there a deal that you can give us high-level numbers on this is how much you bought it for? How many students do you have? And at average, um, and this could be a typical deal that you would find in blue, um, especially with the houses that you buy. Um, and what could be the potential returns that you can have? can be a recent deal, doesn't matter. Certainly, I'll talk through my most recent deal, the place I'm busy with now. Right. Um, I, I got home about a month and a half ago, drove in through the, through the driveway, got a yeah. uh, WhatsApp message from one of the agents. It was a Property24 link. I opened it and immediately my eyes went open when I saw, wow, this price, below a million in this area. Yeah. And I immediately drew a lightstone 
report on the property, I said, wow, this place is, place the, is currently in the market at two thirds of its market value. I yeah. need to see this place. And, and I you were in your driveway at that time. Yes. And I... <laughs> I thought I was dead. <laughs> you against gangster. Anyway. Man. And then I... As I was walking into the house, I give this agent a call. I say, listen, I want to see this place. He yeah. says, yes. Yeah, the, the older gen, it's an old gentleman. He's in his 80s already in a wheelchair. lives by his own. He's going to go to get his Sasa grant the following day. I said, no, you don't understand. I want to see this property as soon as is possible. Yeah, yeah. So he said, all right, how about we meet there in half an hour? I said, great. Thank goodness I went because I knew there'd be lots of interest. And that property only had been listed that afternoon. Right. When I got there, there were two other agents already with their clients. Thank goodness I was the first client to walk through. Yeah. As I was walking through, these people were peering through the, the fence trying to see what's happening. <laughs> As I walked I out, off alone before I even went. <laughs> so I walk and I, as we walk out, the other agent goes in. I said, listen, give me the OTP. And yeah. I filled in OTP and I offered full asking price cash. Full asking price was 950,000 Rand. My market price, market value, 1.4 million. Wow. I however put in that I said that my cash would be available in five working days to the transferring attorney. So I made a cash offer and this cash offer was accepted immediately in tears. The gentleman accepted it. He, he had to, that was the Monday, the Thursday he was moving into an old age home. So yes, it was a distressed property, but it was also a highly motivated seller. He needed to sure. sell. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And I was definitely not in the place to take advantage. I offered him his full asking and that was that. Yeah. However, I didn't necessarily have 950,000 cash on me at the time but I had five days to get it. <laughs> I thought you had the money. If I could, I could go and free up some money somewhere, but no. Yeah. So I sent out WhatsApp messages saying that I want a million rand, yeah. promising to pay it back within six months and a fee of 100,000 rand on it. So 10% in six months. There's a lady who accepted. She's, she lives in Bethlehem, funnily enough. I don't know her, but she lives in Bethlehem. Yeah. And she asked if I would be willing to drive through to Bethlehem the weekend. I said, you don't understand. Let's have a Zoom meeting, much like this. Yeah. And um, the deal was proposed. I sent her the deal, talked it through, and she borrowed me the money. Yeah. And I'll be paying her 1.1 back the, in, the by March. Actually. Say again? So she, I, borrowed, she, I, I borrowed a million rand okay. from her. I, to make calculations, I said, I borrow a million rand, I'll give you 1.1 back. Sure. So, thank goodness I have um, transferring costs and a little bit of refurb costs as well then. Yeah. So, um, I borrowed the million. And as I also asked the gentleman, would he mind, seeing as he's moving to the old age home, if I start refurbishment in the transferring period? And he said, no, not at all. So, I started refurb. Yeah. But please note, I'm refurbing with an investment card. Sure. I don't, I'm using an investment card, a very nice investment card, which only has an interest rate of prime. So I'm very happy there. And um, in total, refurb plus the money I've got to pay the lady, everything, I have to fork out 1,380,000 Rand, roughly. However, I immediately started speaking with the bank, especially ABSA. They, them and I get along very well. And I already started talking to the lady. This property registered in, in the company's name that I'm buying it last week, Monday. I put in my application for refinance the following Tuesday. Yeah. But I'm doing a big refurb. I'm doing over both bathrooms, the kitchen, pulled out all the, the um, mats, tiling. So the place is really and I'm painting inside and out. It's going to be really going to be the best house on the street. Sure. So I'm, I'm hope I was hoping to get a value of around 1.5 million instead of 1.4. And they gave me 1.5. This morning I spoke to the lady. She says it's approved. Wow. So one point of 1.5, I have to pay one, 1.1 million to the lady borrowed me the money and another 280 odd to refurb the house. 
So I'll be yeah. putting in 120,000 Rand in my pocket with the acquisition of this property. I will, because it's not rezoned yet, and to stay within municipal regulations, I'll be putting in a maximum of 10 students for now. Okay. Uh, once, however, I've applied for rezoning, my rezoning is approved, that number will go up. But at, at this stage, I'll be getting around 33,000 Rand per month gross income. Right. Subtracting my bond costs, all expenses, and deducting a vacancy loss, I'll be getting a passive income or a, a surplus of around 6,000 Rand a month. I know 6,000 Rand doesn't amount, sound like much, but what is my return on investment? How much money do I have in the deal? That, and that, what is my risk? That, that's, uh, you know what? I am happy that we actually jumped in into this, into this conversation because you have just defined infinity returns. Exactly. You, 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 have no, you have no money in the deal. Zero. And no risk. Nothing. Yeah. I like this. And what's interesting, my, over lockdown, my son and I, my, my children have always looked at me wondering, another student house, why do you want to provide student housing? They didn't understand. <laughs> but over lockdown, we had a lot more free time. We were playing cash flow and, and, and it's as if the eyes open. Yeah. And my son, I asked him, as I came back, I told him I'm going to look at this house. I came back and I came back with this big smile on my face because my OTP was accepted. Yeah, yeah. And I told him, the, this plan which I have and nothing was in fruition but I planned it I saw it ahead and thank goodness everything is coming into fruition and I asked him okay how much money do you need to make money and he goes thinks he says none the realization that you don't have to have money to make money was yeah yeah it's, it's a big moment for him and I'm so happy I could share it with him at that age, he's 17 now. If I, if I had known what he knows now at 17, can you imagine where we would have been? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean your, 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 your child is going to have what I call a leapfrog in life because of the sacrifice that you, the father, is, is taken through. And for me, without- But you any, too. 100%, yes, yes. yes. So, so for me, I am always, actively seeking for that Dana because I grew up with no dad right exactly so so I am always seeking out for that to say how can I leapfrog my family into where they potentially need to go and work because they have to work you know and neither am I saying that they mustn't work they should work mm, exactly right? that's what life is all about you work but work in the space that you love exactly right I'm amazed by this deal this is a Freaking amazing deal. Well done, Donna. High five to you. Thanks. The irony is I, I shared this deal over WhatsApp with Andrew and he said, yeah. oh, you're going to flip the deal. I said, no. Why would I want to flip? Because then tax comes into it. I'm going to re refinance. And his eyes went up and he realized what is happening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose um, it's different liking for different people. Yes. You know, where you are in life. I'll my mind, when you were talking, I already see where you were going with this deal. I was like, Dana is going to um, uh, put in a bond on this and he's financing. I can see it. And boom, you proved me right. Um, but for mm -hmm. some people, yes, they're going to flip. Um, and for me, that's not how you get rich. You get rich with the equity. You get rich with the passive income. Mm -hmm. And out of that, you grow growing your portfolio. So well done. Then I'm going to no, come to, to a close now. And with everything that you now know, what is the one thing that you potentially underestimated before you were in property? But that thing now is super key in your business now. The value of relationships right. and people. It's not who you are. It's who you know. And if yeah. you treat people like people, you'll be amazed at how good they can be for you. And the other thing is, if you want to win-win for them too. Yeah. And that's the most important. For example, this example where I use this older gentleman's house, I wanted him to win. Sure. And as I said, he, he accepted my offer with tears in his high, eyes. He didn't expect that. Sure, sure. And that's the thing. Treat people like people, you'll be amazed 
and how much value can come back. Awesome stuff. Dana, is there a business book that you can share with us that has been your favorite business book? I'm going to be cliched. Yeah. Without a doubt, Rich Dad Poor Dad, that I've read it 12 times, 13 times since my first time. It yeah. really changed my mindset. What I wish, there's another book I wish I'd come across a lot earlier, yeah. was the, the Millionaire Real Estate Investor by Dave Keller. Yeah, I've read yeah. that one too. Good book. Yes, where my experience is that where Rich Dad Poor Dad works a lot on your mindset and the way you think about money. Real estate, a millionaire real estate investor, more or less talk, it gives you a better indication of where the tire hits the tar, what you should do and how you should go about it. The practical stuff, yeah. Exactly. Another very good book, which... I use now with this example is buying property with little or no money down by Brandon Turner is an amazing book where he talks of nine different ways of acquiring property without using your own money. Yeah. Yeah. And if anyone else wants to learn how to buy property without using your money, that's a definite good book. I've read that book as well. Uh, I can confirm. Yes, it is a very good book. Um, Yeah. What does success look like for you, uh, Dana? I'm going to touch on what you said earlier. Yeah. What does it help you reach the top of the mountain, but you're there by yourself? Absolutely nothing. Success to me is having a good and happy marriage. Yeah. Having healthy and happy children chasing their dreams. Yeah. And then secondly, being able to do what I love and add value to other people's lives and make a difference. And while I enjoy that, that's what success is. The money is just an add on. That's all. I always say that money is a vehicle. Exactly. It's a tool. It it gets you to where you want to go to. I forgot the gentleman, but he, it's also a business motivation speaker. He used to say, if you give enough people what they want, you can have everything you want. Wow. Yeah, you're right. And that's the thing. You, you, need to, you need to work, like you said earlier, but add value. Make a difference in other people's lives, and you can have everything you want. Boom! Ladies and gentlemen, I did tell you, it's a successful friend of M5. And uh, Dana, he's been killing it. I like this guy. And now you know why I like him. But remember, he's my friend. Eh? So <laughs> do, don't be DMing him. He's my friend. Dana is my friend. But Dana, it's been awesome hanging out with you. I like your deal that you've just closed in now. It's, it's, it, it really makes me happy. And uh, over and above that, you know, I, I just enjoy your journey. Um, and I know that there's still many other stuff. I, I think we need prayers on your reason. Because if everything else felt, just pray about it. You That's know? all a person can do. Yeah, I think we almost need like the prayer of Nehemiah just to bring down like the heavens on those people, you know, like, <laughs> let's get it done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, that would be a serious game changer for you. Um, in the community at large as well, you, you to double up there. Um, but I, I want to close off by saying, why did you decide to go with a business coach? I read another book, um, The E Myth Property Investor. Yeah, I've read the, it twice, first, and I realized the first time it, the first time it went, and, yes. and I read it the second and the third time, I was like, Oh, okay, yeah. and I realized that maybe I need someone to keep me accountable. I know these things have to be done. And it's not necessarily that I don't know and this person necessarily knows more than what I do, but I need someone that to keep me accountable to ensure that these things are done and they get into place. Sure. And that's why. Awesome stuff. Dana, any closing comments uh, to our audience, people who are wanting to jump into um, student accommodation, people that are loving to do real estate in general, I'm of the view that in the smaller towns, that's where the gold is. They say Johannesburg is the land of gold. I don't think so. I think the gold is long gone. In the smaller towns like Bloom, um, and there's many others out there, there's really, really wealth, especially in solving pre- people's problems. So your, your closing comments are done. TJ, beyond any doubt, 
I think property is the best vehicle there possibly is yeah. for wealth. Yeah. But a person has to learn. You have to have a basis of education. Right. And unfortunately, education is not necessarily for property investment. is not necessarily presented at a tertiary institution. You have to educate yourself. Yeah. And that, therefore, it's open to everyone. It's not a closed door. You can walk into exclusive books and buy the books you need. And you can even walk into a second-hand bookshop and buy it at a discount. And you yeah. can even get for free if you use the right apps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes. And the other thing I'd like to say is that any goal without any action behind it stays a dream. Nothing happens. So if you're hoping to get into property investment or student accommodation, don't just set it as a goal and not do anything about it. Get actively involved, do something and chase your dreams. But otherwise it just stays a dream and could turn into a nightmare if you just let it go. <laughs> I was going to say something else, but I'm not. Thank you, Dana, <laughs> for having us here. It's been great hanging out with you. And um, for some of you who would like to know a little bit more about Dana and you know exactly who you could be in bloom or in and around there, um, in the comments below, you'll be able to see uh, some of the links where you can reach out to Dana. But, ladies and gentlemen, it is over and out. And that's why we are always hanging out with you, is to share these stories so that you can see how it's being done. Where it can be done, it doesn't matter where you are, but there is opportunities in real estate, and we can explore it. But Dana has just mentioned, I think at average, maybe four books, that you can, uh, you can jump into and out of those books, you can learn so much, so much many things uh, than me and Dana could ever teach. And some of those things, it, the teaching really comes in from you doing something. So that's where you're going to learn. Listening here is not going to help. Yes, it's going to get you excited, but doing is going to get you there. My name is TJ Tarai Jack. Representing M5 Successful Friends, and it's been great hanging out with you. God bless. Goodbye. Thanks, TJ. Yes. Awesome. Cheers.